Welcome to another session of our chat show, Did You Know? A project that attempts to give tourist guides more to talk about when they entertain their guests. But also to give South Africans a better insight in and a knowledge of who we actually are and what we do. Today the focus is on Afrikaans music. And my guest is another household name. Somebody who is ever-changing and yet stays the same. Changing as she constantly invents herself with every album. Or like Kuni de Villiers once said, not because she's desperate, but because she's so creative <coughs> and in touch. Yet she stays the same sophisticated, warm, hard-working professional all through her long and illustrious career. Lori Karao, welcome and thank you. Thank you for giving us your time. Thank you. Thank you, Jolene. It's it's incredibly special for me to, to have this interview with you and to chat with you. And I just want to say at the offset that I have such an admiration for the guides and the people who are doing the work that they are doing and that you are dedicating your lives to showing other people our beautiful country. Thank you very much. Well, it's, it's absolutely wonderful to have this country and you sing so beautifully about it all the time. So I get totally <laughs> emotional when I look at what you've achieved in your life as a musician, Marika. Uh, 26 know. albums, c CDs and 40 awards. 40, oh, yes, you have right. Oh, my right. word. Have you been yes. <laughs> I can't believe it's amazing. <laughs> Lorica, we can be so proud of you. No wonder that you were awarded the Order of Ikamanga for your outstanding contribution to the field of music and also raising awareness on political injustices through music. So it's just so amazing that you are here today and that we can touch base after so many years on Did You Know? Let's have a short walk down memory lane. We got to know each other when we were students in Stellenbosch, drama students. And together we faced the forces of nature, people like Rina Bota, Gisela Tega. <laughs> <laughs> oh, very much Rina Bota. She, you know that she still um, plays an enormous role in my life and especially in my professional life. She's, whenever I perform, she's sitting on my shoulder. She was, a, she was definitely a force to be reckoned with. <laughs> Absolutely, I can remember. Actually, we shared a tutorial group with her in our second year, I think. Yes, that's right. It was not an easy time. <laughs> <laughs> and that's where I learned most of what I know today, you know. Yeah, you I know. know. Same here. Same it's, not here. Always, it's not always easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> same here. But we also had parties and we had Germanicus, the famous Germanicus performances that we had. Yes, but in Pierre van Wyk Lowe's uh, play, yes, that's yeah, right. Yeah, exactly. But we also had parties, and I can remember when we were sitting at these parties or dancing at these parties, and Dorica was there with her guitar, singing <laughs> and entertaining. And little did we know that we were dealing with a world-famous person. <laughs> <laughs> I must tell you, I, I came upon, I was asked the other day to, to do a, a sort of a, a talk uh, about my student days at Stellenbosch, and I came upon some student photographs. I must send them on to you. Maybe you want to use them in this interview because it's it, especially now referring to the parties I was in one of the photographs I was sitting with a guitar with everybody very possibly drunk around me <laughs> so it could, could be interesting absolutely please send them on <laughs> this is real that was those were really the days I mean I can remember so many instances of yeah, the tussies flowing and whatever. <laughs> yes, tussies the <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Oh, but let's have a brief bio. You are a Catonian, born and bred. And yeah, some of your songs actually reflect that. I, I, one of my favorites, Lisa Seclafid, Blow Bass is of course. So you, you, you are a Catonian at heart or just that you were born and bred here? Well, I, I don't think you ever leave Cape Town, even if you leave Cape Town. So I'm, I'll always be a Cape Townian. That's how I grew up. But in my early 20s, I moved up to Gauteng. And um, I, I think I'm, I can call myself a naturalized Tingy. <laughs> you know, I've, I've been here for much longer than I, I was ever in Cape Town. So, yeah, no, but it, it, will, it, it will always be my base basis. But you, in Cape Town, you were introduced to music at a very early age, yes. especially singing. Tell us a little bit about that. Yes, I, I had parents who were very culturally aware and, and 
all three of us, my brother, my sister, and I were musical. And um, we had the wonderful opportunity to sing in a children's choir called Um Hannes Eise Kinner Sankram. And it was, it was exacting work, you know. So a lot of what I learned um, about singing was, was by what Um Hannes Eise taught us, but in a choir, because I think I always think that's the most sound way for a young person to develop their voice voices instead of uh, you know doing uh, singing lessons and so on that you have to sing in a choir and be led by a fantastic choir master then that's your that's your beginning and yes of course i sang in the choir and then i also started um playing music playing the piano when i was about five years old and and that was also a privileged situation because I I had the opportunity to to play in all the Eisteddfords and to do um, a musical uh, exam at UNISA every year and so you know that's how I developed uh, the instrument. Later started um, playing the guitar and so on. But it it my environment as a child was was centering around the choir and that was about from when I was five till I was about fifteen. Wow. So, I mean, yeah, that sounds absolutely. And I mean, at five to start playing the piano and I can remember I took part in this, I stayed with that more on the speaking side, but you were. Yes, in, yes. What? Yes. Oh, oh. And then you, you, your trick to how ting you, was it for career opportunities? <laughs> this is a little bit of a personal story. I thought maybe that will amuse you. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, nobody has ever asked me why did I move up to Gauteng. I think everybody thought I, I moved up to Gauteng because of career options. But you must know, oh my goodness, if you get me going on these things, I can talk for, for hours. But you must know at the time, there were no career options for a singer. And I didn't even know that I was going to be a singer when I moved up to Gauteng because I just trained as a, as a drama student and I thought I was going to be in theatre. So, but you know, you're wild and carefree and life is at, at your feet. And so you, you take these, these chances and I moved up to Gauteng, but I'll tell you why I moved. Because I was in, in, in my family and my friends and then in a wonderful situation in Cape Town. I was in a steady relationship with somebody and I thought it was steady. And then I found out that he that he cuckolded me, that he betrayed me. <laughs> so, <laughs> so this really happened. And I had two choices to carry on as if nothing had happened, but dying inside. Or I could make a move away from my life in the circle of friends in Cape Town where I grew up and, and make a new life somewhere else. So I chose the latter. Mm -hmm. And and there was a price to pay. I eventually lost contact with a great deal of my Cape Town friends. And Chris and I reared our children without the incredible support that relatives and, and siblings and friends can offer. And I struck out on my own, not knowing how things were going to unfold personally and career-wise. I really didn't know. I could not have foreseen that it was going to work out this way. But once I decided on the move, I did not look back. And I, I never returned to live in the Cape. Well, there you are. So, so, so. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. <laughs> it, let's focus a little bit on music, Afrikaans music specifically, um, because when we as guides sort of travel these long distances with our people over our country, we, we play songs, obviously, and then it is always so great if there is a story uh, uh, you know, around or behind the song. Yeah. Have you got songs of yours that have a story that we can tell people? Well, um, I mean, I, I don't know if you want to hear a story about the song in particular or to want to hear a story of how it came about that I sang the song, but I'll, I'll just dive into it and hope for the best. Um, I know that my first hit called Kinnos Van Event was written by Kuz Du Plessis. Um, that was uh, very serendipitous. I I was asked to sing a sing a few songs for a, the first Afrikaans television series called Phoenix and Key, mm -hmm. and Jana Solier was a cabaret singer in that in that series, <laughs> and she she had um, done some studying with Irene Franks to to actually sing her own songs in the series, but in the end she asked if uh, they could get a ghost voice for her. And and so I was chosen as Janus Oyer's ghost voice in this in the series <laughs> Phoenix and Key. Um, 
but then right at the end, there was this song by Cuesta Plessis because he wrote most of the songs that were in the series. Um, right at the end, they asked me to go into the studio completely fresh and sing this song and record this song. And um, I recorded Kuna's Funny Vint, but at the end of the evening, Katinka Haynes and Chris Barnard, they were the, they were the director and writer of the series, um, said that they were going to use this song as a theme song for the series. But it wasn't intended to start off with. But after I recorded it, they decided on that. And the rest, as they say, is history, because um, a couple of months later, the first um, episode started airing on SATV. And um, it made quite mm, an impact on people. And what was absolutely wonderful is that it was 13 episodes and I sang for 13 weeks in people's lounges. <laughs> and, and what happened is that, that it became a huge, massive hit and that I managed to uh, build my career on the basis of this incredible hit. And that's actually coincidence, if you yeah. call it that almost. Yeah. It it's incredible, eh? Yeah. Ah, it's amazing. And I mean, it still is a hit. I mean, it's still one of the most beautiful songs. Yeah, it's a Yeah, sorry. Afrikaans music has gone through so many stages and encompasses so many genres that there's really something for everybody. But from Hey Babariwa Sadangas Vim to the chamber music, and of Van Vaik to Kusi and those guys, and even in 1973, a country music song won the coveted Sari Award for the Song of the Year. But Which one was that? Was that hot or what was it? No, it was something my, something my wife, my husband or something oh. like that. <laughs> okay. But then, I mean, the interesting thing is that six years later, the South African music scene changed completely from the sentimental and melodramatic crowned trekkers. Uh, with the introduction of new names like Laurie Karauch, Anton Goosen, David Kramer, Goose to Plessy. Amazing changes. What do you yeah. think prompted this change? It was also, um, well, serendipity is called Suta Tufal in Afrikaans, which <laughs> I think is so beautiful. And it's, I've used serendipitous already, but it, it really was incredible the way everything collided and, and converged because it's as though our little crop of singers that we were waiting in the wings um, mm. because when the opportunities came, and I must say that I do think that television, which started in 1976, I think that television played a big role because programs were made with us and that type of thing. So obviously that sort of put us on people's laps, you know, as it were. But um, but but we we, we were... We were doing um, good work to start off with, but we were working in little enclaves, you know, performing here and there at a house party, or as you say, in parties at the university and so on. But but nothing sort of came together, and it's as though it was a completely new wave. You know, Twitter golf, and and we were all ready. That was what so was so amazing. It's not that somebody first had to come out and get out of the blocks. We were all ready, and we just went for it. Amazing. I can remember a concert that I organized for for um, the Wellington Art Society with you and David Kramer. Yeah. And it was just it was just uh, amazing to to see the live the life that came from all of that. Yeah. And yeah, I mean all of those I mean you guys were just so alive and you were just so on point. You were just there. <laughs> amazing. But but Jolene, the, the audiences were just fantastic. Fantastic from the start. The audiences were just amazing. Yeah, yeah but there was a hunger. There was a yeah. hunger for something real and something authentic. That was yeah. amazing, I think. Yeah. Yeah. Um, they, and people could relate. Yeah. Exactly. And, was and some, some translation from overseas or something. Yeah, but, but the important thing is also, Lorica, that one could hear the words. And yes. I mean, that you could, you know, it wasn't just a sort of a noise in the background. It was it was <laughs> meaningful and it was us, you know. Yeah. That, was, that was what was so amazing. And it was, you know, I mean, uh, Dylan got a, a, a Nobel Prize for his for his work, but it was our stuff was very much or still is, you know, the the people write on an incredible level, you know, they, they really put put their minds to it, put the seat of their pants to the seat of the chair, and they write good stuff, and they, mm -hmm. they were they were really good stuff, yeah. 
And uh, Afrikaans music apparently is currently one of the most popular and best selling industries in South African music. Yes, that's, uh, sure. Yeah, I just read that the other day and I was quite surprised at that. And happy, of course, very, very happy. Yes, 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 yes. No, uh, it's incredible. But it's, it, as I said before, it's, it has a lot to do with a very loving and loyal and, and warm audience and participatory audience, you know. Now. But, you know, my favorite still is, you know, amongst all the Afrikaans songs is the so-called Luisterliki, which is an Afrikaans song with lyrics that contain a serious message and which are considered more meaningful than yeah. those of most pop songs. Yeah. Uh, you're a prime example of that. One can listen to your songs, understand every word, and the songs actually change you, whether it is by letting tears flow or making you proud wow. or letting you look at autumn in a different way. Do you think that your your drama training contributed to to the writing of the lyrics and your delivery? Without a question. And look, I'm not a songwriter. What I have done is I have put a few beautiful poems to music, and they were relatively successful. Things like Ingrid Jonkers, Tumari Donkerman, and Burnieff's Naksang Surois' Wangert Blaar by Hexrufti. But I was working with phenomenal texts, you know, but I can't write songs myself. But the ones that I have been blessed to, to record, um, and the idea is always that you must be the first to record a song so that it's not a cover, you know. And mm -hmm. I've, I was blessed to be the first to re record many, many amazing songs. Uh, Sorry, but, but I think I've lost my track now. You asked me something. Oh, about the lace that looking here. Yeah. Oh, about no, my no. training, yeah. The but the important thing is that, 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 you know, I think in our drama classes, we, we were introduced to poetry that, that, yes. that made sense. And, yes. and that you put that to music was just absolutely fantastic. Yeah, it is, but you know, I always, the people always ask me, how do you actually um, put, a, put a song to music or, or, or a poem to music? And for me, um, what I would do when I, when I uh, uh, composed a, a, a melody for a, for a lyric or a, or a poem, is I would I would memorize the poem and then I would know it so well as if I have to present the poem as a poem from a stage. And once you get to that stage, if you've done that with a poem in preparation, then the melody actually comes by itself because the, the poems have their own lilt and their own mm -hmm. phrasing. And it's it's quite fascinating. I haven't done it for years, but it is a fascinating process that it's 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 there. It's in the. It's in the words for me. Yeah. yeah, exactly. The words. Yeah, the words literally speak for themselves. Yeah, yeah. Uh, we spoke about Kinder van Event, which was your first hit single in 1979, but you know, you, you didn't tell us that it was one of the only Afrikaans. It was the first actually Afrikaans song in the late 70s to simultaneously reach the number one position on the Radio Five and Springbok Radio Hit Parades. No, that Must was have been quite. Yeah. yeah, that was quite unique because Radio 5 that didn't feature Afrikaans music, but I suppose it was because of the television series and people were hearing it, so they were asking for it. So I was just very incredibly blessed, yeah. And and so, so did it inspire you? I mean, was it something that, that was inspiring to you, the success? Yes, you, you asked me, um, are, you, are you asking me whether I'm... Uh, getting a hit like that translates into money and yes. <laughs> um, my, my answer to that is um, not at the time because you must know that we were basically pioneers and and we had to work very hard to um, to make money out of um, performances you know it was it was a slow slow moving process in the beginning to get out of the blocks and and to establish a career it's it's a <laughs> People always ask me, is how do you establish a career? I just say hard work for very long. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, but it's but, like uh, first yeah. perspiration. Yes, yeah. 90%. But, yeah. Sorry, I didn't get that. Now, in Pifa Vaiklo always said that it's 10% inspiration and 90% perspiration. Absolutely, absolutely. And But what, what Kanos Van Uben did for me was, of course, it opened doors. It started off my careers. And at the time... Um, I didn't know that a big hit was so important. So it was just so amazing, you know, that I had this opportunity to to kickstart a career um, on on the on the strength of this hit. I just want to tell a little anecdote because you'll appreciate that. Um, Johan van Jerden was one of our mates in the drama school, 
um, a very astute guy. He was always very, very astute. He could kind of pinpoint things very, very well and define it very well. And I was, I think it was in the second year of my of my career, and we were invited to sing at the amphitheater, the Oda, Oda Libertas. It was then Oda Libertas, it's now the Stell Amphitheater in Stellenbosch. Mm-hmm. And we were a group of artists. David was there, Anton was there, and so on. And um, I knew that Johan was in the audience that evening. It would be the first time that he would see me uh, or hear me sing, perform in this context. But of course, he would have known Kinnisman event already by that time. But to cut a long story short, after the show, he came to greet me. And I was all bright-eyed and bushy-tailed, wanting to hear that he said, you are amazing, you are stupendous. (laughs) And he just said to me, you never do that ever again. And I said, what are you talking about? I got goosebumps all over my body. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't know what I did wrong. He said, never, ever do that again. And I said, what? He said, never, ever sing your biggest hit as if you've sung it before. You have to create it every time you perform it. And it was, I think, the best advice I could ever have got. Cut me down to size and put things in perspective for me. (laughs) Well, that's Johan. Johan could do that very well. <laughs> yeah. But yeah. your 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 successes took you overseas uh, as well, quite well, many many places. And I think it's it's quite relevant for us as guys because we do entertain people from all over. Um, but you had performances in Belgium, in the Netherlands, Germany, London, the Czech Republic, New Zealand, Australia. I can go on and on and on. Um, I assume your performances were mostly in Afrikaans, or did you yes. also have your Braille interpretations? No, never did Braille overseas. They were always Afrikaans songs, um, but my program always consisted of a mixture of Afrikaans and English songs. And the, the organizers would always ask me to um, to uh, elucidate, well, how just the right word, to uh, describe the song before I sing it. So. That I found quite disconcerting most of the time. Look, in the Netherlands, Belgium, and in London, where it was mostly a South African public, that was easy. But the other countries, you had to actually describe the song and explain it a little bit, and that that sort of halts your flow of a show, you know. So I always found those shows quite challenging to do, and I would maybe group a few songs together and then have a little story and then carry on. But... But it was quite a halting experience for me in some cases when I performed overseas. I can I can imagine that, and especially I think also with the Charles University in Prague, mm. uh, that invited you to represent Afrikaans specifically as the youngest member of the Dutch language uh, language group, rather. Uh, oh. But it was an audience of academics, and I was wondering, you know, uh, did you did you have an academic discussion on the Taal or? Did you get questions from the audience or were they translations of the lyrics or something like that? Yeah, I, I, I don't recall the translations of the lyrics, but it is possible. I think that would most probably have been done. But there was, it was a whole week. So they, all the delegates were there for about a week. So our performance, I sang with Fani Fushia as my, um, on my, uh, my accompanist. And uh, our performance was sort of, you know, like they often do the performers as the sort of um, highlight of the evening of a dinner or something like that. So our performance was had that kind of tinge to it and there was no discussion. They would have had the discussions beforehand in the week prior to the performance, but the f- performance sort of ended off um, the, that evening. I went back to Prague a year or two afterwards and then sang in the most beautiful old church. Um, and that was just straightforward, you know, again, performing to various very eclectic people yeah okay well Prague I think sometimes when I think of Prague I always enjoy the music you know they are so many unbelievable people Prague. Yeah. Ah, it was yeah it's wonderful We're just walking through the streets and hearing the music yes. so it must have been lovely to be performing there oh that's lovely and also you know the Eastern Bloc people they the children uh, before the curtain fell, the, the, they, the, it was mandatory that you had to take an instrument as a school subject. So they they all so educated in that way. Oh. Oh, what a what a privilege! What a privilege! <laughs> yes. Um, you you performed for you know in front of huge audiences, thirteen thousand people, and um, yeah, probably even more. Does the size of an audience influence you? Uh, not the size of an audience, 
but um, who accompanies me, that that influences me. Yeah. But the size of the audience is, you know, one gets trained, as you will know, that um, you're singing to one person at the <laughs> time. You're not singing to a mass, massive amount of people. So, um, no, that, that doesn't worry me. It's actually quite energizing and exciting. But I must tell you, to sing with an orchestra is not something that one does all the time. And even though I've got classical training, um, I'm just a Buddha Macy and I'm just a chorus girl. So I need a percussive backbeat to help me to jump off that to be able to do my phrasing. Mm -hmm. So it was sometimes quite challenging to sing with big orchestras. Always a lovely, uh, lovely thing to do. And I, I hope I rose to the occasion. But there are all kinds of elements like you, you're dependent on the conductor. And sometimes you stand right in front and you can't see the conductor. So you've got to feel the orchestra and you don't necessarily hear all the right instruments. But this is just me. You know, the other singers are so au fait with this kind of thing. And I'm quite embarrassed to, to reveal this. <laughs> but, um, but in the end, uh, the type of accompaniment that pleases me most is uh, for the last more than 20 years, I've been working with Clinton Waring as my pianist. And... There's a symbiosis that that um, develops between a pianist and a singer that you cannot describe to anybody, and it is sublime, literally. Mm -hmm. And you go on that stage and you feel like one person, and you are so attuned to each other, and you just do the best you can together for the audience. Um, for me, in the end, and I've worked with lovely guitarists and other pianists as well, for me, in the end, having one, one accompanist has, has been the most satisfying for me. Well, I can imagine because I mean it's just a team team effort to yeah, bring bring effort. forth art, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. But well, music is obviously a huge part of the culture of a nation, and by culture I mean who we are and what we do. And like I said before, you know Arnold van Beek, Hubert de Plessis, the Fast Revere, those guys, they harbored very different views on, for instance, apartheid, which was the state policy at the time. And their views actually came through in through their music. Do you mm. think that Afrikaans music reflects on who we are and what we do today? I think so. Um, Afrikaans music is a house with many, many chambers. Mm. There's a crossover element in our audience which I find gratifying, fascinating. I find it comforting. And it's interesting, the same people listen to a very wide range of performance. We all get our support. And we, you know, we don't have such a big amount of people but it, it is incredible but uh, I think you you don't even have to go and search very much to to get a feeling of what kind of exceptional work is being done in terms of political political statements and 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 universal statements you know they you've got we've got wonderful wonderful performers I think of, of the full frame movement of what was it in the 80s the late oh. 80s where young African singers rebelled against the authoritarian regime of the time yeah. and were certainly not received with open arms by, by, the, by the public. Yeah, uh, yeah. But not quite at that level. In eight, 1981, you were in the cast of Henny Ocom's Met Permissi Gese. Yeah. That show was actually, was it the first Afrikaans full art cabaret? That's what they called it, yes. Yeah. <laughs> and it was a form of civilized protest against yes. the government of the day. So it, let's just let it be a little bit philosophically here. Which type of protest do you think has actually more impact? The civilized protest, or as Gandhi would call it, Satyagraha, or the heavy stuff like we had in theater productions, like those our classmate Davi Milan was part of in the space theater and in the market theater in Joburg. Which one do you think has got more impact? I think they both have impact on different levels. They are just so, and the older I get, the more I understand how many things there are that I still have to learn about. But um, on different levels, they and they speak to different people and, and they have different messages. For me, the civilized protest route is, is what I've taken over the years. Uh, I just want to mention that Henny Ocamp, the Afrikaans writer, actually mm. coined, coined that phrase of civilized protest. Mm. Yeah, that's right. But like I said, uh, um, Gandhi spoke about um, Satyagraha way back you know, as, as, a, as a peaceful protest. Yes, yes. Yeah. So, and I mean, that was, yeah, but that civilized protest is actually what it is more about. Yeah. Um, but little, back a little bit to you personally, you see, you received so, so many awards. I am not even going to try to list them. 
Um, but somehow the order of Ikamanga struck me. It must have been something special to you because it's one that is given by the president for excellence in the fields of arts, culture, etc., etc. And you're in the company of quite some big names there. Did that yeah. have a the place in your heart? As you say, to be in the company of those big names, I mean, it's not just that year when I received it. it it's um, it's not the specific president that, that gives it to you. It's the it's the it is a presidential award. So what whichever president is uh, in in office at that time is the one who presents you with the award. But it was quite a, an experience to be amongst those people and to be to be reckoned amongst them. It is for me. I'm just very honoured, and it was it was it was very special. So what are you actually more proud, most proud of? If you think of your work now, sort of think of about all the years that you've been busy with this. Things like Steel Huta and Maniki's Ru, which was your first Afrikaans album to reach platinum status, or that it was the first female Afrikaans album ever to appear in South Africa as a CD, or the other awards, or is there something that, that really makes you proud of, of what you've achieved? It's interesting. Um, I just uh, happened to to watch a, a, an interview with Oprah and James Corden last night. Mm -hmm. And she was referring to his, I think, 10 or 20 Emmys that he had won over the years. And she asked him, do you, do you feel different now that you know that you've got all these Emmys under your belt? And he said he actually keeps them in a cupboard and it actually keeps him humble as well not to look at them too often <laughs> but you know one doesn't one doesn't actually have to assimilate the fact that you've received all these awards because um it's i suppose it's a known fact that people know that what i've concentrated on over the years was the work the work the work but you ask me what the things are that i am most proud of then i would think the longevity of my career and that I did manage to reinvent my work from time to time. But that was mainly in the early years, I think, um, when I participated in, in quite eclectic uh, mix of live shows. I did. I would, for instance, do Jacques Brel's music with Toby Kuschlik. I did that for about two years. And then I would uh, do, uh, there was a, a wonderful venue called Club 58, just a little bit, about 100 meters up from the Chelsea Hotel where we did the Braille and it and there Yanni the two and I performed Fun by Lane to Bob Sontain. Mm -hmm. And then later on Peter Turin asked me to be in a jazz show on Hoagie Carl Michael's music. And I did that, you know, so I, I kept on experimenting and, and and trying my wings in various ways and it wasn't always successful, but I suppose you have to make mistakes in order to learn. Would you I think I was I was quite brave sometimes, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but brave was a reason. Um, <laughs> you've made such a huge contribution to the Afrikaans language through your songs uh, and the creative words that I, I wonder sometimes if it will ever be equal. But the interesting thing is that your husband, Chris Tor, who wrote so many of your lyrics, is an English speaker. Yes, that's right. So yeah. How does that work with, I mean, you know, what is your professional relationship? Is, is that do you yeah. help him? What, how does it work? No, he does it all by himself. But um, it is it is a very unique situation. Um, it's it's also known that I didn't know that he could write songs when I got married to him. He's a he's a professor of economics, so his his direction is completely different. But we, I think, uh, Nina Nina was about eighteen months old when he first presented me with his first song, and that was Op Blauwbergse Strand, and. Um, and he just went on from there and he wrote these amazing songs and, and he would sort of disappear in his office and I wouldn't know what's happening because he would work on a keyboard with an earphone and I wouldn't know or hear anything. And he would be grafting away at these amazing lyrics because it's not his first language. Um, but he went to Stellenbosch, so obviously he's very good in Afrikaans, but it's not his first language. And he would write these just incredible songs mm -hmm. and then he would present me with them i remember when he presented me with oblobas Strand the first time i burst into tears i just couldn't believe it <laughs> so it's it's been i mean i've been in quite in awe of him all along but he unfortunately has stopped writing songs now he, he, what he has written is written but um the ones that he did get down oh my word yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah no they are they are amazing i'm just thinking of Hot gates and all of those amazing. It's amazing oh, stuff. Yeah, Great question. Can an Afrikaans singer get rich? 
there are singers who manage to do very well, yes. Great. And then lastly, where do you think Afrikaans music will go from here? Have you got any ideas on that? I have no ideas, but I, I cannot believe what is happening on the scene at the moment. I mean, listen to young artists like Demi Lee Moore, and she's a very good singer and a live performer. For me, that combination needs to be intact. You know, you must, it's no use, you're just good in the studio, you must be terrific on stage. Because that actually, I think, provides the longevity of your career, is if mm -hmm. you're good on stage. And people like Churchill Nudir, Rian Bernardi, he's a quite new singer, but beautiful singer, and Spuchwolf, the group, and Loki Rothman, who is so multi-talented, and Early B, and Jack Farrow's beautiful rap stuff, and he was fantastic. There are so many more. Um, Afrikaans is in good hands, and... I cannot, I cannot believe what's happening now. If this is happening now, I don't know where it's going to go. Well, fantastic. Lorica, we, our time has run out a little bit. Lorica is one of the most prominent singers involved in the revival of popular Afrikaans music in the late 70s and early 80s. She's performed in major venues like the Royal Albert Hall and Wembley Stadium all over the world, and so many of her performances were sold out. Not only has Lorica contributed to light foot tapping music, but she also added songs that tell us more about our history. I think of a song like The Singer, songs that can be used on our tours to tell stories about our country and our people. Have a look at her website to get more information. It's www.loricarauch.com. Lorica, your song, Iendach Asik Otis, reflects on growing old, but I find yes. it a bit um, maybe ludicrous because this voice, these songs that you have blessed us with and their impact will never grow old. Aye. So thank you so much for being part of this initiative and thank you for being just Lorica. Thank you, Jolene. Thank you, everybody. God bless.